I'm normally here for GIDS, the Great Indian Developers Summit in April. How many of you have been to a GIDS event? Oh, very, so nice to see you again. How have you been doing? What's changed? Yeah? Now, how many of you here are here for the first time for the Mobile Developer Summit right here? Wonderful. I love seeing that. Welcome. I'm glad that you're here. Um, as Usha said, my name is Scott Davis. I run a web uh, consultancy in the United States called thirstyhead.com. And this is what I do. I do public speaking. I do private training. I do development. And I write books. Um, and for the better part of my professional career, I have been working in the web. My first book for O'Reilly was JBoss at Work, so I've done Java web development. Um, I've written books on Google Maps and open source mapping. I've written books on Groovy and Grails. And for the last number of years, I've been focusing on HTML5 development and specifically mobile HTML5 development. I was at Yahoo for nine months last year, helping them project uh, their, their web properties and get them mobile ready. I spent time at Yale University and Carfax and a number of places. But let me get a quick show of hands from you. How many of you here are web developers? Right, HTML or CSS or JavaScript? Ah, very nice, very nice. How many of you are mobile web developers? Ah, uh, we're best friends. This is what I spend my time focusing on, is mobile web development. How many of you are Objective-C developers, iOS developers? Very nice, very nice. How many of you are Android developers, Java developers? Ah, very good, very good. Well, thank you for indulging me in that. I've got one more question for you before we get started. And this may sound like a strange question. I promise you I'm not drunk. Not yet. Not yet. Now, if you were an ugly American like me, you might answer very quickly, well, of course, Scott, this is the year 2012. That's according to the Gregorian calendar, yeah? But my good friends over in China might suggest that this is the year 4710, the year of the dragon. My Jewish friends might tell me, no, 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 Scott, this is the year 5073, and I wouldn't leave you out. My good friends who follow the... Kali Yuga calendar suggests this is the year 5114. Yeah? Yeah? Very good. Well, my question to you is who's right and who's wrong? Well, the answer, of course, is that they're all right, right? Everyone has a different relative way to measure time. So in that spirit, I want to suggest to you that it's none of these years. The year is, in fact, the year 21. Now, why would I suggest such a preposterous thing? Well, because it was 21 years ago that the very first website went live on the Internet. In April 6, excuse me, August 6, 1991, Tim Berners-Lee published the very first web page. Now, let me ask you one more question. How many of you in here are younger than 21 years old right now? Anyone? You are very mean people. You're making me feel very, very old right now. Yeah? I'm actually terribly jealous of you because you have never known a time when we didn't have the World Wide Web. Very exciting time we're living in, especially as software developers. What I love most about the web is the fact that this is the very first web page, and it is still viewable on the web right now. Take a moment to consider that. Can you still go to the movie theater and see the very first movie ever produced? Can you turn on the television and see the very first television show ever aired? Can you turn on the radio and hear the very first song ever played? No. But yet here we are talking about the web 21 years later and the very first web page is still available. That's exciting, isn't it? We have a deep, rich sense of history as web developers. A lot has happened in those 21 years. We're going to talk about what's happened in those 21 years. Now, this is the very first web server. This is an X-Step machine. It sat on Tim Berners-Lee's desk. This is not in production anymore. This is sitting in a museum somewhere. But what I love about this, can you read the sticker on the front of this computer? It says, this machine is a server. Do not power off. Yeah? Can you imagine a cleaning woman 
walking into Tim Berners-Lee office after hours, dusting around, and she said, oh, silly man, he forgot to turn off his computer. And with one button push, she turns off the entire World Wide Web. Amazing to consider, isn't it? Yes. So what we're going to talk about today is this thing called the World Wide Web. But what's interesting is Tim Berners-Lee thought of a number of different names when he was considering this. He considered calling it the information mesh. Hmm, that doesn't quite sound good, does it? He considered calling it the information mine or the mine of information. And while those are interesting names, is this really what you think of when you think of the web? Probably not. We can say, oh, there's a veritable gold mine of information out there. And that's true. But would you think of men, smelly, dirty men, crawling around under the earth looking for tiny nuggets of information? Is that the evocative metaphor we want to have for this thing called the web? Probably not. We've tried on a number of different metaphors. One thing we tried was the information superhighway. It's hard to even say that with a straight face now, isn't it? No one calls it the information superhighway. What professional in this room says, what were you doing yesterday? Oh, I was surfing the web. Probably no. Right? And while these are very interesting metaphors, what we have to realize is they're wrong metaphors. Because things like highways and surfing imply that we're going somewhere. When in fact, we're not going somewhere. We're still sitting on our couch. All the world's information is coming to us instead of us going to the world's information. So Tim Berners-Lee came up with this notion of the web, the worldwide web. And it's not hard to realize why he thought this was such an apt metaphor for what he had just created. Because when you start with a single document, which links out to other documents, which links out to other documents still, you can begin seeing how this is indeed a web of documents deeply interlinked and literally scattered across the globe. So while the World Wide Web is a very rich metaphor, and absolutely correct, far be it from me to correct Tim Berners-Lee in his creation, but I'm going to suggest to you we've got a better metaphor. And that metaphor is water. The web should flow like water through all your devices. And let me take this metaphor one step further. When you drop blue ink into a bucket of water like this, very quickly the ink consumes the entire water. So much so that we could no more extract the blue ink back from the water then we could extract the web from our lives. The web is truly on every glass screen in our life. In this talk, we're going to talk about the web on computers. We're going to talk about the web on smartphones and tablets. Yes, we're even going to talk about the web on smart TVs. The web is truly everywhere, so much so that I get on an exercise bike in the hotel and it has the internet available on it. The web is truly everywhere. So what we're going to talk about is certainly the web. And our world starts in the year 1 or 1991, depending on which calendar you want to use. But this is more than just talking about the web. We want to talk about web services. We want to talk about apps, and we want to talk about devices. And I'll give away the punchline right now. The web has consumed all of these, much like the blue ink in our bucket of water. But let's begin talking about web services. And the reason we need to start talking about web services is because when Tim Berners-Lee invented the web, he conceived of the web as a series of documents. The web was very much document-focused when he created it in 1991. And don't believe me. Back on that original website that I showed you, he wrote an executive summary. Isn't that wonderful? 
the creator of the web wrote an executive summary. So if you had any question as to what this technology was for, you were able to read it. And this is what he said. He said the World Wide Web consists of documents and links. Now let's think about that for a moment. Tim Berners-Lee was working at CERN, working with scientists, and he wanted to provide a way for scientists to publish their scholarly papers, publish their findings. And he wanted them to be able to publish it in an open standards, non-proprietary way. And so with that in mind, we can understand why publishing documents was so important. And when it comes to scientific papers, what's paramount? What's the number one thing you need to do when you are dealing with scientific papers? You need to cite your sources. You need to say, my research is based on these four other research projects. Those four projects were based on those other projects. And so we can see, based on its academic beginnings, the web was fundamentally predicated on documents and links. That was in 1991. By 1995, a mere four years later, the W3C had been formed, the World Wide Web Consortium. And the big brains at the W3C said, hey, you know what? We could do the same thing for data that we ended up doing for documents. And they came up with this thing called XML. It's hard to believe that XML hasn't been around forever. It feels that way. But it came around in about 1996. And it's no mistake that XML and HTML look an awful lot alike. They both have those same pointy braces, don't they? You could cut your finger on the edge of one of them if you're not careful. Yeah? But they're both based on SGML, SGML Standard Generalized Markup Language. Tim Berners-Lee felt SGML was a great precursor to HTML, and this team felt that SGML was a great precursor to XML. As well. That's why XML and HTML look so much alike. They share a common ancestor. So that was 1996. By 1998, we had created a whole suite of web services, SOAP based web services. How many of you have done SOAP development? Yeah, ah, very good. You remember that, don't you? Do you remember so what SOAP stands for? Simple Object Access Protocol. That's what it originally stood for. They officially deprecated that name. Why is that? Because there ain't nothing simple about SOAP, is there? Not in the least. But this is one of the founders of SOAP, Dave Wine. And the reason I talk about him is because he was also the guy behind XML RPC. He was also the guy behind RSS. So Dave Weiner has a lot of history serving up XML over various web services. But let's get back to that idea that there was nothing simple about SOAP. It's because it grew up at a time when they wanted those web services to be loosely coupled to the underlying protocol. SOAP came around at a time when the web was very popular, but we also still had gopher sites and Waze sites and FTP sites and things. So the guiding principle of SOAP was that we want to be loosely coupled to any particular protocol. We want to run over all protocols. And unfortunately, that introduces a layer of complexity, doesn't it? Let me ask you one more time. How many of you wrote SOAP web services? Raise your hand again. How many of you ran SOAP over a protocol other than HTTP? Raise your hand. Anyone ran SOAP over a protocol other than HTTP? Look around. Crickets chirping, right? This is unnecessary complexity. So two years later, a smart guy named Roy Fielding, this is the guy who is one of the principal office, off, uh, authors on HTTP, the protocol. He said, why do we need that extra layer of complexity? In his doctoral dissertation, he coined the phrase REST, representational state transfer. But what's most important about this is he reunified the web. He said, if you are not going to use a protocol other than HTTP, then let's base an entire set of web services on those HTTP verbs that we already know. HTTP gets and posts and puts and deletes are what we use as web developers serving up documents. Why not use that for data as well? This is a wonderful idea. 
And if you look at the programmableweb.com, it's a wonderful website, by the way. It's the Google of web APIs. If you have an API out there, it'll be listed on Programmable Web. This is their latest stats, just based on a couple of days ago. We can see the overwhelming majority of web services out there are restful at this point. This was a big idea. Now, the interesting thing about REST is that it says nothing about the payload. It dictates the verbs we're going to use, get, put, post, delete, but nothing about the payload. So it could just as easily serve up HTML as it could serve up XML. But then there's a problem with XML as well. I'm not an XML hater. I like XML quite a bit. But what browser on the planet speaks XML natively? None of them. Browsers from the very beginning have been taught to speak HTML very well. They speak CSS and they speak JavaScript. So if you have a browser that already knows how to speak JavaScript, why would you send it XML? Browsers speak XML as well as I speak Hindi. Why not speak the language of the browser? And so this gentleman, Douglas Crockford, invented JSON. And I have to say invented in air quotes. Because do you know what JSON is? JavaScript. He did absolutely nothing to invent this technology. He popularized the notion of when you're making that HTTP GET request, why don't you send down JavaScript objects? JSON is JavaScript object notation. So why don't you send down JSON as the payload instead of XML or HTML? So I'm going to go so far as to say this. Now, when I'm wagging my finger, I'm not wagging my finger at any of you. You're the good guys. You're here learning about these technologies, right? So when I wag my finger, it's not directed at any of you. But I'm going to wag my finger anyway. Several times in this talk, it is professionally irresponsible if you write a public-based website not to offer a RESTful JSON-based API. I'm going to say that again without my finger pointing. It is professionally irresponsible for us as web developers to offer up a website that doesn't have a RESTful API. Simon is going to talk about this in the case of Facebook. The key, Nico talking about key is predicated based on these things. There is not a website out there right now that doesn't offer a public-facing JSON-based, RESTful-based API, except maybe one of our websites, right? And we need to fix that. So what does the future of web services look like? Well, one of the reasons why I think it's so easy to offer this is because we have persistent stores like this, CouchDB. Anyone in here using CouchDB? I've used CouchDB on several of my projects. A big, strong hand goes up over here. I love CouchDB because it is of the web, by the web, and for the web. This is a database, but not a traditional relational database. This is one of those NoSQL persistent stores. And while there are a lot of good ones out there, Cassandra, MongoDB, React, a number of these, as web developers, we should have a special place in our heart for Couch. Because rather than loading up SQL drivers, you use REST to interact with this. You make HTTP GET requests for your queries, you make HTTP PUT requests for your inserts. You use HTTP DELETE requests to delete data from the database. And how does the data come back? Not as a JDBC result set, not as XML or YAML or anything else. It comes back as JSON. So if you are using CouchDB as your database, problem solved. You already have a public-facing, RESTful JSON API. It doesn't have to be hard, does it? But what else can we say about web services? Well, what if we decided web services themselves were redundant? Tim Berners-Lee again, this time in 2001, writing in Scientific America about this idea called the semantic web. And he says, for too long we have separated documents and data. What can we do to bring these together, to reunify things? And there are a couple of different solutions out there. RDFA, 
micro formats. But in each case, what this is about is embedding data directly in your web pages. Now, this may sound kind of scary and future facing. I don't want you to consider RDFA or micro formats until there's lots of evidence out there that this is going to take off. I don't want you to use it until there are a bunch of major websites already using. Oh, yeah. All of these folks are already using RDFA and micro formats. We should be using these things as well. So let me give you a couple examples. This is Best Buy's website right over here. They're a big box retailer. This is where we go to buy televisions and DVD players and new computers. This is what the human sees when they go to their website. When you do a view source, this is what the machine sees. Because as a human, I can read store hours and know what that means. But a computer needs to know that these are the opening hour specifications. This is RDFA. This is based on a specific dialect called good relations. That was engineered, that was built from the ground up for retail stores. So when I look at this and I see MUN, M-O-N, the big brain on the human here says, oh, he must mean Monday, right? If I were viewing this in, in Mexico, it would say lunes, right, for Monday. But for the machine to understand what this is, we have to come in here and say, no, this is the canonical representation of Monday. So whether you say mun or Monday or lunes or even just M, we can let the computer know exactly what we're talking about in absolute terms. As a human, when I see 10, to nine. I know that the first digit, the first number, is when the store opens. The second number is when it's closed. But we can use RDFA to be explicit about this. This is what I mean about the unification once again. This is HTML and data all in one. This is documents for humans and data for the machines. Lots of examples out there. I know the guy who wrote this book. If you're looking for Groovy books, this is, a, this is a nice book. I enjoy it quite a bit. But that's what the humans see when you go in and do a view source. This is on O'Reilly's website. And O'Reilly embeds the same kind of metadata in there so we know the title and the subtitle and the publisher, the author, and what year is written. Yeah? So when it comes to web services, while they started separate as HTML and XML, what we see is by about 2005, the web has consumed web services. It's no longer a separate thing like SOAP. We're using RESTful APIs. We're using RDFA. We're using microformats. So what did the web do for apps? Let's talk about that. Remember, the first web page was published in 1991. By 1995, a little website came out called Amazon. Have you heard of it? Yeah, of course. Of course, right? In 1995, Amazon was selling things. It started selling books and eventually DVDs and music and refrigerators and baby shoes and everything in between. But clearly, this was one of the first examples of the web not being used for scientific documents, but an application. You used it to buy things and have them magically show up at your house. A year later, in 1996, Hotmail came out. And what I love about Hotmail, I didn't realize this until I did some research on it, Hotmail is nothing more than HTML with a couple of strategic vowels injected into it. Yeah? This was the very first website where you could answer your email, send new emails. Does this mean that HTTP replaces SMTP, simple mail, transfer protocol? No. Does HTTP replace IMAP or POP to get your messages? No. But this is the first time we began seeing the web being used for an application instead of simple reading of documents. Now, what's most noteworthy about Hotmail is that Microsoft acquired them in 1997, and very shortly thereafter, they had a novel idea. Now, I'm going to say something nice about Microsoft right now, so I want you to be prepared for it. They invented this thing called XHR, XML HTTP requests. 
Because as they were rolling out Exchange 2000, they wanted to have a web client, Outlook Web 2000. And they said, you know what? The web right now has very coarse grained request response cycles. You type in a URL and the entire page refreshes. You click on a link and the entire page reloads. What we want is we want to be able to be reading a message over here and have the inbox update independently. We want to have the spam folder and the deleted folder update independently. We don't want to have this macro level HTTP request response cycle. We want to have micro level HTTP request response cycles. These are still RESTful requests, get, put, post, delete. And you can see that Microsoft was initially sending XML down the wire. That's why they called it XHR. But HTTP doesn't dictate the payload. You can just and easily send down plain text. You can send down HTML snippets. You can send down JSON. Now, if you don't recognize XHR, certainly you recognize Ajax, don't you? Ajax is just the brand name. XHR is the implementation under the covers, but Ajax is this wonderful evocative term, asynchronous JavaScript and XML. What's most interesting is Jesse James Garrett coined this phrase. And he coined it two weeks after Google Maps went live. And I remember this vividly because I was working on the Google Maps project. Now, I'm not a Google employee. I was never working on it there. But at the time, I was working for a satellite imaging company called Digital Globe. If you ever flip over to satellite view and zoom in on your apartment, zoom in on your backyard, look at the copyright. If that says Digital Globe, those are my bits. I was flying satellites and selling bits to, uh, to go now. I was working on a very large team that was doing that. But I remember how exciting 2005 was. I remember how exciting it was to have this map that you could drag around and the page wouldn't refresh. How did they do that? It was magic. It was magic. It was Ajax. That one big map was, in fact, map tiles. 256 by 256 pixel tiles. And so as I drag the map this way, I have a bunch of Ajax requests to download new tiles. When I drag the map down, I send out a bunch of Ajax requests for new tiles. So it's seamless to me as an end user, not using macro level requests, but micro level ones. Jesse James Garrett also talks about Google Search. Think about that. When's the last time you've actually clicked on the search button when you went to Google? You begin typing, and with each keystroke, you're round-tripping to the server, sending each keystroke. Google is sending down your results more and more accurately with each keystroke. By the way, that is something that only works in practice. It doesn't work in theory at all, does it? In theory, you'd say, that's ridiculous. How wasteful, sending every keystroke back to the server, sending down results with every keystroke. But in fact, I love it. And I would be terribly disappointed if they took that feature away. That was what Ajax brought to the party. It was a very different way of doing things, so much so that we coined this phrase, Web 2.0, right? Saying things are totally different now. Jesse James Garrett was the guy who coined the phrase Ajax, but Tim O'Reilly was the guy who coined the phrase Web 2.0. Again, the founder of O'Reilly Publishing. I'm an O'Reilly author. But he was sitting around at headquarters, and by the way, this blog entry, available on the web as well. All of these articles I'm showing you right here are available. I encourage you to go back and read them. But Tim O'Reilly wrote this in 2005, and he said, how did the web used to be at that point 15 years ago, and how have things changed on it right now? And he came up with a number of different examples. I like this Britannica Online to Wikipedia example because it brings us back to the Tim Berners-Lee story again, doesn't it? Web 1.0 was very much about publishing scientific papers. Web 2.0 was about Wikipedia, where not only can you publish papers and I can publish papers, but I can go correct your errors and you can correct mine. Radically different. And while there are lots of examples up here, what I think capitalizes, captures, the core distinction of Web 2.0 is the move from publishing to participation. 
the move from publishing to participation. Now, we called that crowdsourcing back in the day, but Tim O'Reilly called this the architecture of participation. Take a moment and think about that. The architecture of participation. What he means is the web isn't participatory out of the box, which is kind of tragic. The very first web browser that Tim Berners-Lee wrote, it was called World Wide Web. That was the browser. That was kind of like a major software company naming their database SQL. Yeah. Or them naming their word processor Word. We're not a very creative bunch, are we? So the very first browser was called World Wide Web. But what we lost is World Wide Web was read-write. It was the tool that you used to write web pages and read other people's web pages as well. Somehow we lost that over the years. And so Web 2.0 was about recapturing that notion and allowing us to participate. Now, oh, I forgot to wire us up for sound here. Let's see if I can do this based on my computer's sound. Are you ready for this? All right, be sure to put down your coffee. I don't want anyone to spill hot coffee or tea on themselves. All right, this is very exciting. Are you ready? All right. Are you hearing this? Ah, there it came. All right. Let me, let me replay that one more time here so you can all hear it, okay? That's, that's the only sound. I apologize. I, I sprung this on you. He says, that's pretty much all we have to say. Elephants have really long trunks. Mind-bending, isn't it? <laughs> My head just exploded. So why did I take all this time to show this to you? This was the very first video uploaded to YouTube. What year? 2005. This started YouTube. Hard to believe it caught on, doesn't it, based on this. But the reason I'm talking about YouTube here is it is perhaps the poster child for Web 2.0. It is perhaps the canonical example of the architecture of participation. First of all, YouTube doesn't create their own content. They open the doors and allow the users to upload this content. But more importantly, everything about the YouTube experience is about encouraging you to participate, to draw you in to the experience. After you watch the video, you can write comments about it. You can rate it. You can turn around and share it with your friends, add it to your favorites, add it to your own playlist, even flag it as inappropriate. Do you see what I mean about the architecture of participation? This isn't passively sitting back and watching someone else's video. This is encouraging you, drawing you in to participate. And there's one other important thing about YouTube that makes it so important. And ironically, it's not the video itself. That's almost an implementation detail that's unimportant to this particular story. What made YouTube so revolutionary is they encouraged you to embed that video in your website. If Web 1.0 was about creating links to other people's pages, Web 2.0 was taking other people's content and embedding it in yours. So much so there's a wonderful book out there called Small Pieces Loosely Joined, written by David Weinberger. He's the guy who also wrote the Clue Train Manifesto. But think about that for a moment, small pieces loosely joined. What a wonderful metaphor for what we do as web developers. Are you going to go out and write your own credit card processing API? No, of course not. Are you going to write your own mapping infrastructure? Of course not. Are you going to host your own videos? I hope not. I hope what we're going to do as modern developers is assemble these various APIs 
small pieces loosely joined could not be a more apt description of what we do as web developers. All right. So the web consumed web services. The web, in fact, consumed apps as well. By 2005, the Ajax revolution was in full swing. There isn't an application that can't be run in your browser at this point. But what about devices? Well, we're here at the Mobile Developer Summit, so I want to dedicate extra time to this. And not this settle down. We'll talk about iPhones in just a little bit. But these didn't come out until 2007. We need to hop way back to 1994, when this was the state-of-the-art web browser. Mosaic, the World Wide Web, the browser, only ran on next-step systems. And so Mosaic was the first browser that opened up the web to Windows boxes and Mac boxes. But at the time when Netscape was popular, handheld devices had a very different browser. They used something called Pocket Web. This is an Apple Newton. It was wonderful that Miko mentioned that in his keynote as well. Right? This was the first device that housed the first web browser, Pocket Web. And what was interesting about Pocket Web is that it didn't render HTML, it rendered WML. Watered down markup language. No, that's not what it was at all. It was wireless markup language, but it was watered down because the CPU power of a mobile device was a fraction of what you had on the desktop. Right now, we're carrying dual core processors around in our pockets quad-core processors on many Android phones. But things were very different in 1994. Very scarce CPU power. Very scarce bandwidth. And so what we had was a watered-down markup language. You didn't serve up WML over HTTP. You served it up over its own protocol, WAP, the wireless application protocol. And so what's interesting about this is we've heard this story before, haven't we? This idea of separate but equal services. So I'm about to wag my finger at you once again. Not you, of course. It is professionally irresponsible for a modern website to offer an M dot domain name. Why is that? Because 1996 is calling, and it wants its domain name strategy back. Back in 1996, we had separate payloads, WML versus HTML. We had separate protocols, WAP versus HTTP. So it was appropriate to have a www server and an m dot server and an FTP server and a mail server. It's not appropriate anymore. These smartphones, in many ways, have more rich, more robust browsers than your desktop browsers. It is an affront. It's offensive to serve up separate domains, thinking that mobile devices are second-class citizens. Yeah. So I keep coming back to these handhelds, Apple Newtons. This is the Palm 7. This is the first Palm Pilot that had internet connectivity. Why do I keep coming back to these handhelds, these PDAs? Because at the same time, these weren't smartphones, and we can't call them dumb phones, because that would be impolite. So we can only call them feature phones, right? But this was state of the art at the time. And you can tell a feature phone because it's got physical buttons on it. With smartphones, you're typing on glass now, aren't you? So with Feature phones, you had physical buttons, but more importantly, you had a postage stamp size screen. Most modern websites assume a 1024 pixel viewport. Are you going to fit 1024 pixels into a postage stamp? No, of course not. Oh, boy. And if you ever did any web development for mobile devices back in the day, my hat is off to you. It was no fun, was it? 
because there were so many different devices, each device with a slightly different screen, with a slightly different set of buttons, with a slightly different SDK. It was almost impossible to write once, run anywhere, when it came to mobile devices. That's what made the iPhone so revolutionary. See, I told you we'd get back to this. In the year 2007, the first iPhone hit the market. And it was revolutionary, much like Ajax was revolutionary two years before. But what was revolutionary about the iPhone is it was a modern device. It had a full-fledged web browser, a web browser that displayed 960 pixels, whereas most websites ran 1024. You could easily get 1024 into 960 pixels. This absolutely changed the game for mobile web development. A year later, Google came out with Android. This is in 2008, the original Nexus handset. And by 2009, this was a really interesting year. Now, this is US market share. I apologize, I'm an ugly American. But the blue bars are the market share in 2009. And we can see in 2009, RIM, Research in Motion, was the undisputed leader of smartphones with almost half of the market. By this year in 2009, Apple had had its smartphone out for a couple of years, so it had a good solid quarter of the market. Microsoft had 19%, Palm had 8%. Let's put our hands over our heart. Palm's no longer with us, are they? Yeah, it's a pity. It's a pity. And Google was just beginning with 2% of the market. Flash forward to August of this year. My, how things have changed. RIM is a shadow of its former self. And I really do hope RIM comes back. I don't want to see it go to the way of the palm. I think that rising tides raise all ships. I want to see a great diversity of mobile devices out there. But right now, RIM is sitting about 8%. Apple is sitting steady at about a third of the market. Microsoft has slipped to next to nothing, although with Windows Phone 8 coming out, I have high hopes for that. I hope that that really re-energizes what they have to offer. But Google, wow, in three years, went from nothing to over half of the market. It just shows you if you give away your software for free, you can really make up market share easily, can't you? Yeah. So between Google and Apple, they have roughly 85% of the mobile market space all wrapped up. But what's interesting is even though Google and Apple are sworn enemies, I hate seeing them argue. It's like watching my parents fight. Why can't they just get along? Yeah, please. Are you listening, Apple? Are you listening, Google? Shake hands, get along. We'll all be better off for it. But one thing they have agreed on is WebKit. Both of them are using WebKit for both their desktop offerings and their mobile offerings. On the desktop between Google Chrome and Apple Safari, that accounts for 40%. They have the majority of the desktop wrapped up between those two browsers. But what's more interesting is on the mobile side of things, WebKit has a virtual monopoly. Because not only is it running Android and Apple, it's what's running RIM, it's what's running WebOS, it's what's running Amazon Kindles, it's what's running Bada, which is Nokia's operating system. It is all but ubiquitous. But more importantly than that, we need to talk about some of the trend lines. And Miko showed you some trend lines where the trend lines were going up straight. I love this. Last year, Apple sold more mobile devices than all the computers they had ever sold since the beginning of the company. They did that in one year. And when you look at the trend lines, the numbers aren't important. This green line over here is how long it took them to sell these Macs. It took them about 20 years to sell 50 million Macs. It took them four years to sell 50 million iPods. It took them three years to sell 50 million iPhones. It took them one year to sell 50 million iPads. Do you see what I'm talking about? These trend lines, when you have trend lines going like this, it means, yes, we need to wake up and pay attention. 
And this wasn't just an Apple phenomenon. In the year 2010, it was the first year that smartphones had ever outsold computers across the board. Computer sales were up 5% year over year. Smartphones were up nearly 90%. These trend lines are hard to argue with. Here's one more trend line for you. This isn't devices. This is internet usage. That green bar is desktop web access. That yellow line is mobile web access. Morgan Stanley estimates those lines are going to intersect in early 2014 or late 2013. When is that? One year from now. We need to start paying attention to this stuff right now. If we wait a year, it's already too late. Google estimates that one billion people with a B will be accessing their various properties from mobile devices this year. Are you ready for me to wag my finger at you again? It is professionally irresponsible for you not to offer a mobile optimized experience. You can't ignore these numbers. And that doesn't mean you should create an MDOT website, right? I told you I was at Yahoo last year helping them put together their mobile HTML5 strategy. Yahoo has a www.yahoo.com and an m.yahoo.com. You know what else they have? iPad.yahoo.com. That's a pretty good strategy, isn't it? Right? Well, do they have android.yahoo.com? No, that would be crazy. All right. Maybe they need to have android.motorola.yahoo.com. Yeah? Yeah? And then android.htc.yahoo.com. And then android.nexus.yahoo.com. That is the road to madness, isn't it? There's no way that we can continue to segregate this web traffic into thinner and thinner slices. We need a better strategy. And that strategy is responsive web design. Have you heard this phrase before? Absolutely. We're at a mobile conference, aren't we? Yes. And what does this mean? Well, I can explain it, but I think it would be much better to demonstrate it. There's a wonderful website out there called 2011.deconstruct.org. And as I resize this website, I want you to notice how those pictures grow and shrink dynamically. Responsive web design is all about leaving the fixed measurements behind. We can't use fixed pixel widths anymore. We need to use percentages. We can't use fixed font sizes anymore. We have to use M's. So that as these various devices hit our website, the website grows and shrinks proportionately. This is responsive web design. And by the way, this isn't JavaScript. This is CSS. CSS3 has this capability baked in. So much so that I want you to pay attention to these text menus up top here. Do you see these text menus? When we get to a certain threshold, pop. Those menus turn into fat finger-sized targets. Because while a mouse has pixel-perfect addressing, these meat sticks that you have at the end of your wrist have about a 40 by 40 pixel tap area if you use the tip of your finger. About an 80 by 80 pixel if you use the pad of your finger, right? So it's entirely appropriate for this website to switch from text links to finger size links. So what does this mean? I'm not suggesting that we should have a one website fits all solution. Quite the opposite. I'm saying we should have a one website that is appropriate for any device you happen to be watching it on. This is how this website looks on an iPhone. This is how it looks on a desktop. Are we dealing with an M dot or a www dot? No. One website that responds to the device you're watching it on. 
You know we're going through an, elect, uh, an election right now in the United States? Here's one candidate's website, how it looks on the desktop browser, and here's how it looks on a smartphone. Huh. Here is the other candidate's website, how it looks on the desktop, and here's how it looks on a smartphone. You know who's got my vote. Wait, did I say that out loud or just think it? I don't know. All right. I have now lost my clicker, but that's okay. Um, what we're dealing with right now is responsive web design, something that is absolutely state-of-the-art. And if you want to learn more about this, there's a great book out there, unimaginably titled, Responsive Web Design. The reason I like this book, it's a very inexpensive book. You can download it for $9 US, it's a PDF. But what I love most about it is the author starts with a desktop-based website, and he iteratively refactors that desktop-based website down to something that looks appropriate on a mobile device. And in the very last chapter, he goes to the far end of the spectrum and makes that website look good on a smart TV. It's an outstanding resource for you. Lots of good free resources out there, but this is an outstanding resource if you want to learn more about this. Because remember the metaphor I started you with. The web should flow like water through all of your devices. It should take exactly the right shape of whatever device you are viewing the web on. Or it should flow you through your devices like coffee because that's what Starbucks uses on their website as well. Yeah? It is professionally irresponsible for you not to be using things like responsive web design in this day and age. It's just not OK. All right. Let's talk about smart TVs. I know we are at the Mobile Developer Summit, but I've had a team of developers at Time Warner Cable for three years running now. And when they started, I said, you know what? This 60-inch TV that we have on the wall has 100 times the screen real estate and 1 one-hundredth of the CPU power of a smartphone. But believe it or not, smart TVs are more like mobile development than you'd expect. And the smart TV, if you buy a TV and it doesn't come with an internet connection, a Wi-Fi connection out of the box, there are lots of different ways you can add it. Rather than spending $4,000 on a TV, go out and spend $99 on a DVD player. And you can now bring the internet to your TV through your Blu-ray player. There are lots of purpose-specific devices. Roku devices, Apple TV, Google TV. Again, for the same price point, 99 bucks. These are little devices that have one foot on the internet and one foot in TV land. They literally are devices that have an Ethernet jack and an HDMI, HDMI jack. That's all they're meant to do. And if you don't want to purchase any of these, certainly you have kids running around that have Wiis or Xboxes or PSPs, PS3s. All of these are ways to bring the internet to your feature TV or your dumb TV or your TV that is not smart. All of these TV manufacturers have free SDKs that you can download. You can go to LG, you can go to Samsung, and in under an hour, download the SDK, have your first app running on your TV or your Blu-ray player. And if you don't have a TV or a Blu-ray player, they ship with emulators and allow you to see these things. These guys also have app stores, which should be very interesting as well if we want to monetize our work. But when it comes to developing for smart TVs, you have a very different UI, don't you? For desktop computers, you have 101 keys and a mouse. For smartphones and tablets, you're typing on glass, but that also involves pinches and stretches and taps and swipes and all kinds of rich UI metaphors. Well, when it comes to a TV, you've got a remote control. And at Time Warner Cable, we have decided that our apps are going to run with a left, right, up, down, and enter interface. It's a really interesting way to do web development. It's kind of freeing, believe it or not, 
in the constraints. Users no longer type on these TVs. They don't type in URLs. They don't copy and paste things. We have found a way that they can navigate through nothing but left, right, up, down, and enter. But that's today's remotes. You're familiar with Nintendo Wii's, right? These are remote controls that have gyroscopes and accelerometers in them. Well, you know what? Modern LG TVs ship with a remote control with an accelerometer and a gyroscope in it. High-end Roku's, and by high-end, again, I mean $99, they have remotes with accelerometers and gyroscopes in it. So you buy a Roku for 99 bucks, and you get Angry Birds for free. It's a heck of a bargain. So where does this leave us? This leaves us with HTML5. And what's interesting is HTML5 isn't specifically for mobile devices, but HTML5 broadens our horizon to the point where it addresses device access specifically. HTML5 addresses connectivity directly. HTML5 allows you inside of a browser to know if you're online or off. It gives you web SQL, it gives you app HTML5 has wonderful multimedia support. If you join me at the end of the day today, I'm going to be talking about HTML5 video. But we also have audio, we have Canvas, we have WebGL for all kinds of incredible game making, 2D and 3D. Google has Quake running in a browser right now. Gives you an idea, a first-person shooter. Gives you an idea of the capabilities of what we have in HTML5. And yes, HTML5 gives us the semantics. All of the micro formats in RDFA we were talking about are not an afterthought anymore in HTML5. They're baked into its core. This is a bumper sticker that you can get from the W3C. And it's very subtle. They don't say, I've seen the future and it's in my computer. They say, I've seen the future and it's in my browser. Because it could be on a mobile device, it could be on a tablet, it could be on a computer, it could be on a smart TV. But the future is in the browser. And in case that was too subtle for you, the W3C says this, one web for all. And you're going to hear that a lot more, one web. Because just like we've talked about how the web has consumed web services and it's consumed apps, it's now consumed devices as well. Now, finally, in the year 2010 with HTML5, we have the technology stack and the hardware that will allow us to do amazing things. And that's why you're at this conference for the next two days to learn how to do these amazing things. And that's why I'd suggest to you the web is far wider than you might have already considered. Did you enjoy yourself? I did as well. Thank you very much for your time.